winter is coming. Star Wars. Finish him! Hadouken! Fatality. And welcome to the Free Your Geek Show here live at 59 Media Studios. Uh, and for those listening to the audio version, welcome to the podcast. Uh, before we get going, uh, first I want to introduce, uh, you'll notice Don is not here today. Don will be commenting if he uh, shows up. He'll be commenting on the live feed on Facebook, uh, either as himself or Free Your Geek. I'm not quite sure yet. But Don, if you're there, we love you, buddy. We have no problem with Don being himself. No, Don, we love Don being himself. KB, here as usual. What's up, brother? And uh, before we uh, before we get into the crux of everything, first I want to introduce our uh, two illustrious guests here. Uh, return guest to the show uh, by the uh, gentleman by the name of Rich Marini. How are you? Good. How are you? Into the mic. And uh, we who who is your guest? That you. This is we usually have to fight for guests, and you're the one that says I have a great guest to bring on. <laughs> and you've worked with him in the past, and you're working mm -hmm. with him currently. So you could do a better intro than I could. So into the mic, sing this man's praises, dude. We got Brian Pollan from Morbid Vision Films. How you doing? Welcome, welcome. Um, okay, you? so you, uh, more, so let's just run down. Let's do. I have a little cheat sheet here, but let's run down. Uh, Morbid Vision Films: writer, director, producer, editor, makeup, uh, actor. You you pretty much run the gamut of everything. It's basically a necessity when you have no budget. You have to basically do everything yourself. So. And well, it's a passion, so. And, and that's, we're going to absolutely get into that. Um, real quick, uh, oh, Don's already saying on the Facebook Live, keep his seat warm, Rich. <laughs> so uh, make sure you do that, buddy. <laughs> I will. Um, okay, so, so Morbid Vision Films. Let's, let's r run through some of your, um, your works, because I, I took a look at your page, and it uh, looks like I, I have some handy-dandy notes here. And a quick shout-out to uh, Erin Ferreira Sullivan, who also supplied me with some fan questions. I call her E.E., uh, e., the exquisite Erin. <laughs> but um, just running through your works real quick, uh, you, you were talking a little off-air. Your most popular is a, a movie by the name of Bone Sickness. And we should, we should kind of uh, get into this a little bit. These gentlemen, these filmmakers, are, are in the horror genre. So um, Bone Sickness is what you were saying kind of off-air is your most... Um, Famous for a lot, you know, or, or got the most, most popular. exposure, definitely. It, that one somehow managed to get everywhere. Well, and I like I was just telling you off here, my buddy uh, uh, Paul is a huge fan of that movie. Uh, Blood Pigs, Morbid Tales, Cryptic Plasm, and Septic. These are the ones I was reading off uh, your website. And for those watching the video on Facebook, uh, go to Morbid Vision Films, um, check them out, Google them. Uh, awesome site they have some cool trailers they're not safe for work no. so just be very very <laughs> careful when you watch them uh yeah they have i both started watching some of them and I was it's, like, it's awesome no way for, for those i mean fans, it's, if you're a fan yeah yeah fantastic um, you know who we're fans of though sponsors who keep the show going so quick shout out <laughs> to pachico's furniture local blast and the ritual sweat society for sponsoring our show um check them out there you'll see their uh, ads running through the video on facebook live um, but for those not on Facebook Live, uh, I, as we, we mentioned we're here with Rich and Brian, and uh, what are you guys currently working on now? What's your current projects that you're working on? Making a movie called Septic right now, and uh, we recently just brought Rich in. Um, we gave him a character, and we uh, doused him with gallons and gallons of blood about a month <laughs> ago, a month and a half ago. But uh, yeah, it's the newest. We're about 90% finished uh, filming right now, but... We probably would have been done by now, but we just keep adding stuff and adding more and more. <laughs> That's always a good problem to have. Yeah. That's always a good problem to have. So you, you, uh, so for those fans that might be wrestling fans, old school attitude era wrestling fans, you basically gave Rich what we would call a bloodbath. Oh, yeah. There was <laughs> a bloodbath. <laughs> so that, you know. Circa, and I loved it. Circa, well, there you go. Um, so I have some questions here just because we want to talk. This, is, this, this show is called For Your Geek, and uh, we want to just kind of have some side discussion here. Um, I have questions that I, I made up here, and I actually got some questions for you too, Rich. I, I had to throw <laughs> you a couple bones. Thanks. Um, Get used to it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but again, I think we kind of answered the first question. What do you really geek out about? And we want to talk about, obviously, horror. Um, what, what, where did this passion start? Like, So for you, were, were you a, like a kid or were you a, like a young adult? What, what kind of like drove you to be like, this is an awesome thing that I want to do? It was definitely when I was a little kid my earliest memories just you know with this month now it's actually was just halloween 
I was always obsessed with ghosts and everything spooky, creepy, anything like that. But the funny thing was when I was a kid, I was scared to death of horror films. I wouldn't watch really? them. It wasn't until I was like 11 or 12 that I finally started getting into so, it. So speaking of being a kid, and, and that's when you, got in, you, you were scared. So what was your first horror film then that you watched that turned the... The first rated R uncut horror film that I watched was The Howling. Okay. And I watched that and I became obsessed. My cousin showed it to me because you got to check this one out. Now, what was it about the film that you remember that really... The atmosphere? Probably the, probably the locations being set in the woods because that's... Always it. scary. What's that? Can always be scary. Uh, yeah, any chance we get to be out in the woods filming, I'm always try to find any excuse to be out there. It's just yeah. something about that location. So that probably had a big impact. And I love the werewolf, so. Yeah, okay. Well, I, and to go to go to your part, like we want to talk about horror because a lot of that is building up the suspense too, whether whether you're a fan of the jump scare type of horror movies or the slashers or whatnot. Like the woods is, is creepy in and of itself. It's dark at night. Yeah. You hear the rustling of the leaves, the, the creaking of the trees, the branches snapping. You don't know if it's an animal. You don't know <laughs> if it's a killer. There's so many like cool things that could pop out. And that's happened to us while filming. We've been out in there. And you, <laughs> and you your scared. light only goes out maybe 20 feet, and all of a sudden you start hearing things. We're like, whoa, man, there's something watching us. There's something. <laughs> and you love that. It's just, but that, that's what puts it. you in the adds to it. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, so we kind of talked about which, uh, what movie kind of got you. Did you have a favorite movie now in the horror genre? Not your own work, because obviously you're going to be biased for that. <laughs> but uh, The Evil Dead. Evil Dead. The, ori the original one, of course. The original. The Evil Dead is just my all-time favorite horror film. How about you, Rich? Um, you wasn't like expecting that question. Or? Yeah. Well, you can, what, what's your favorite anything, horror movie? Anything. doesn't just even anything. matter. Whether it's current. Could have came out yesterday. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I kind of like, actually, the new Evil Dead. Okay, I so think the new ones really so good. old school versus yeah. new school yeah. right here. We're gonna yeah. we're gonna see these guys. Uh, my opinion on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I've always loved The Exorcist too. So oh, The Exorcist is classic. Yeah, I know, yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's let's go the other side of the coin. Do you have any horror movies that are like what? Why is this even considered horror? What's like your least favorite? Like th 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 this is, I, and I don't want to put you on the spot. I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> but if there's anything you you or to rephrase. Anything that you might have been like, oh, I wish they would have done a better job with this. Like, it had potential and kind of fizzled out. I'm open to almost all of them. I mean, I'm very forgiving. But it wasn't until recently where I could I probably actually answer this question. But when I watched Cabin in the Woods, I was just like, this is crap. What so is so the Joss Whedon I helmed. hated that movie. And everyone, one thing, the only thing I had a problem with was everyone kept saying how original it was. And my wife was a huge Buffy the Vampire Slayer yep. and Angel fan. And I'm like, he already did this in his TV shows. That right. huge finale was the finale of it, both of those shows. I'm like, I've already seen this. <laughs> so I had a problem with that movie. I, don't I know. got you. Well, uh, I'm just going to read some comments real quick because uh, Don wanted to know what your favorite movie was. I think we just uh, kind of hit that. Uh, Kate Eppers is saying hello. John Viveris is Hi, saying Kate. hello. Aaron's hello. saying hello. We got people coming in. Uh, again, Brian Pollan. Uh, from Morbid Vision Films. We're talking about his current stuff. We're going to be getting into that. Um, but I do want to talk about uh, how... So when you said when you were younger, uh, about 11 years old, that's when you first like kind of like got that passion for the horror genre. Have you seen, like, from, your, from those movies, when, when it first grabbed you and you gravitated, has your taste for the genre changed at all now as a filmmaker? Kind of like saying, okay, this was cool, but now I'm more into this type of horror as opposed to if anything that's changed before it used to be like um obviously growing up in the 80s and everything was really effects heavy like i would just watch anything that tom sabini did the effects for or mm -hmm. whoever or scream mad george he did oh, i gotta watch that now it's just different because i don't know cgi has kind of just ruined everything that's what i was gonna <laughs> ask so <laughs> what was your what are your thoughts on cgi as far uh, as as far as stuff like jurassic park that's great or even some other stuff. I mean, granted, I prefer models for like space type movies and everything. Right. But fine, I can get, I get it. The Avengers, whatever. But when it comes to CGI blood, there's absolutely no excuse for it. It's okay. not hard to do. It's just I when I see that, it takes me right out of the movie, and I, I lose respect for the movie instantly when I see CGI blood. Now, my question to you: How okay? So CGI blood. What about like CGI? We talked about your love of werewolves. What if you see like a CGI werewolf running down? Hate it. Okay, <laughs> you'd rather it's gotta be, be a real role. I yeah, I. I mean, if it's like <laughs> even, even the like actors a, get a Jim Henson like puppeteer yeah. type thing. Because CGI half the time it's transparent looking. It unless it's Jurassic Park quality, which it's gone downhill since then. I don't right. see how twenty years later it's worse than it was back then. Yeah. 
there's just you can tell it's not really there. Yeah. There's no magic. It's when good for sci-fi films and yeah. That kind if of stuff. all right, it's just a quick, uh, a quick cheap movie. They just just to get on sci-fi yeah. or on and, f- and in fact, in what is it? The Star Wars Force Awakens. One of the things that um, that Abrams had done was try to minimize yeah. that and and made a better movie yeah. than the other three prequels. I know we're not talking about that or talking about horror, but. That was one of the things to capture that feeling oh, yeah, that people definitely. got from those '80s movies. Well, so just I can see if that. you're gonna say compare that, I mean, look at the original trilogy of Star Wars, and then then watch the prequels. Yeah, it's just like a glossy mm-hmm. gloss cartoon. Over. Yeah, it's basically just yeah. a cartoon. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, we go to movies to see live action. Yeah, <coughs> Not, I hear you. If you're gonna, all right, I'll go watch an animated Pixar movie and want to see that. You know. Well, Kate on Facebook Live says she totally agrees about the CGI, but Don uh, is in stark opposition. Uh, <laughs> says he loves uh, CGI and horror, uh, which is kind of interesting. He said it's, he does it says it's done so much better with CGI. I personally think there's a time and a place. Now, the last mo- horror movie I saw, if you want to consider it that, because I think Don doesn't consider that, but you agreed. Well, you were there. We watched it, the remake of of it. Yeah, in the I haven't theater. seen it yet. Um, I think, for the most part, that they balance a little bit of the humor. It was kind of like a, a Goonies meets horror. But to me, uh, there was a little bit too much CGI. There were some areas where it was used really, really well, and then some yeah. areas I'm like, you could have done something different. Well, maybe there's some things that are impossible. No, that, no I agree. Know, but what I'm saying is I think, I think if you can strike a good balance, and yeah. it looks, to your point, looks like CGI blood. It, you, it does take you out of yeah. it because you can tell. But I disagree. Well, back, it was never impossible before. Yeah. Except a movie like The Avengers or something, fine, I get that. Yeah. But when it comes to a horror movie, because you're not having these huge epic battle scenes. So right? you should be able to mm-hmm. find some way to Yeah, they always found a way to do it before and yeah. now it just it just is cheapening. It's almost like a gimmick. Yeah. It's for like, horror I'm talking CGI yeah. and horror films. Right. I get the other stuff, whatever. Yeah. Me. But yeah, it's just Yeah, because because uh, Don Don's saying he's only talking about CGI as far as wolf but wolf specific. I, which I, is I guess oh, though Wolf. speaking, <laughs> I guess though speaking of it though, how do you feel about that whole horror vibe? Like since Stranger Things came out of that kind of, have you seen? I Stranger love Stranger Things. Things. But how do you great. feel about that coming like now? Because it had that kind of feel. Do you think like the industry is going to go more towards that kind of thing? I you don't think we're going to see a lot more of it. I, like I said, I haven't seen the new one yet. Like at what point would it become kind of? Eh. <laughs> you know, what point would it be too much? I guess is the question. If, if I can, if I can interject, yeah. what I what I think we're, what you're saying is, do you think it's going to go down the the path of the same type of uh, like story arcs and just like the, yeah. the feeling of a Stranger Things and oh, I following if, a group of bunch of kids? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, like, yeah, like, like yeah. at what but, point does that get old? And but I I think I think that's good and bad because I'm a big proponent of if something's working, not that you do it ad nauseum, but if it's going to bring more yeah. eyes to yeah. to the product or to or to the genre and get people to more into horror movies where they'll check out other things that might be okay. Well, I like these horror movies. Let me go check out, you know, this new Open Doors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the new Leatherface or whatever, you know, whatever remake there when we'll talk about that how you yeah. feel about remakes and, and, <laughs> and stuff like that. But I I think if if you make it accessible to a group of people and they like so it was like to me a perfect example i've never seen i've never read the book and i i never saw the made for tv movie so i went in with a fresh mind and i was like i loved it and then i watched the tv version and nothing against tim curry but the the voice that he chose to use uh for pennywise i was just it took me so much more out of it when you know like because it sounded like a a bronx new york and i'm like how can you take this seriously (laughs) same way you were with star wars and that's the thing, like, and, and that's the, <laughs> not that I'm a huge Star Wars guy. He saw episodes one to three first. Oh, jeez. So I never, I never <laughs> saw. Yeah, so <laughs> it ruined it for me. That's like, the wrong way to do it. <laughs> right, right. We're not talking about that. <laughs> but, uh, come on, it was a fair comparison. But, but let's let's in that same vein. What are you going back to? What we talked about before? When something works, and they do a remake. Um, how do you feel about them remaking like a classic? Like if they update, because I think they're talking about doing a, a new Halloween, if I read that correctly, and it's going to ignore everything after the second movie and it's going to be like a reboot from the second movie. How do you feel about situations like that? I, don't know, I think it just depends on the quality of the movie. Who's I mean, doing it? And yeah, because well, John Coppner's involved now. They're bringing back Jamie Lee Curtis. So I'll, that gets me excited. I'm looking yeah. forward to see what they do. It's just when they do the, like we had that long run of just, cheap cash in you know like the nightmare on elm street remake was just yeah. thrown out there so it's just to make money off the name yeah. same you know fright night again crap it was oh. just those were just like all right let's just which one can we remake next and they just throw them out yeah texas, when they, Ch- texas chainsaw 
Yeah, yeah, I didn't. I loved all those movies. <laughs> no, I, 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 I no, movies. I love, I love them, but I know it's still mm-hmm. a cash grab. Like even if they're yeah. corny, like you I can tell it's actually old. one of my favorite ones. But you could tell those were just simply made just because it was the big thing at the moment. Yeah. Whereas, but the <clears throat> like people always bring up John Carpenter's The Thing. Yeah. I'm like, well, that was more that came together as a project, not just hey, let's just make this movie to throw out there to get opening box opus, you know, box yeah. office, you yeah, know, numbers. So, I mean, it just depends on, dep- I guess it depends on who's behind it, really. I, I think I, cause I think it really depends, and to your point, who's behind it and how it pays, like, uh, homage to that movie, but yeah. at the same time, how it kind of... Like, Brings something new at the same cause, time. Because, again, yeah. me being not a typical horror guy, like, the one I can think about is, um, oh, my God, what's the one with the... Uh, the creatures in the the mountains, uh, the hills have eyes. Hills, hills have eyes. I saw the remake before I saw the original, and I really liked the remake, and I really liked the original. So yeah. to me, it, there was a lot of you know they updated it in certain yeah. areas where, like I was like, okay, this is cool, this is updated, this is new, but yeah. it still had that same type of feel. And you know, with the special effects, with the costumes, with the, the makeup and and whatnot, it made it that much scarier yeah. to me because it looked more realistic. To and me. that one had a good director behind it too. Right. I forgot his last name, but Aja from Hot Tension. Okay. He directed it, so he brought his brutality, you know, sense into it. So it stayed the dark movie that it was supposed to be. Right. But then to me, like, and I don't know how you guys feel about the the sequel to that, but the sequel to the remake, I didn't like it at all. I thought it was terrible. (laughs) Right. Okay. So we're on the same page there. I'm Um, not. (laughs) Go ahead, ahead, Rich. I'm not on the same page. Why why not, sir? Because I liked that movie. That was a really good one. The Hills Have Eyes 2, the remake. Okay. You know? Derek Mears was in that. He's one of my faves, you know. <clears throat> I just liked everything about it. It was like, you know, a lot of good kills and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, so. Okay, well, difference of opinion. Difference of opinion. I that's have okay. all four. I have the two originals and the two remakes. So. But that's what this show's about. Right. It's, 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 all about <clears throat> it's all about whatever you're passionate about. And speaking of that, so from this love of horror movie, how did you decide to start making films and, and, and directing? And how, how did you get into all that? Give me just a... It was basically me and a friend, was another friend, Rich. Um, we were just such hardcore horror fans that it got to the point where watching wasn't enough anymore. We had to find a way to take <laughs> part somehow. And uh, his cousin had a camera. This was back in 1990, a long time ago. And we borrowed it, and we just, at first, we just went out in the woods just imitating the Evil Dead and stuff. And then I wrote a small little story, and we're like, all right, let's try it. Let's actually try to see if we can do this. And it just grew from there. And just keep Once expanding, yeah. and expanding your Once ideas. Once we had the first one fully complete, we were addicted. We were like, oh, my God, we got to, all right. We're, we're, what can we do now? Yeah. What can we do next? Within the next month, we started yeah. the second one. So <coughs> it just grew from there, just from wanting to be a part of it. So, so over the so course badly. of, like, so you're talking, what, 27 years? Yeah, it started in 1990. So that's, that's a long time. Um, how many movies estimate do you think you've done? Like counting all these small ones? And I think officially we've had seven or eight released yeah and then probably all together with the shorts maybe 12 or 14 so you take like your time with these too it you takes us a long production. time yeah it takes us a long time to finish Good. something but that's also because you you know and from just me surmising love. here is the, yeah the love and the passion you have yeah. for it you're like i'm not going to put out a hap, haphazard yeah. thing where i can't get like you were saying before you you you'd like to be wrapping up now with your your current project but you keep finding more things yeah. to add. And if it's going to build to that story and it's going to build and it's going to be help your vision get even bigger and what, like now you get all these new things happening in your mind, I think that's really, really cool. So you're not gonna, about to rush something yeah. just to put it out because you want to get something out. And it's the fact that we're not using it, someone else's money either. Right. So we're on our own time schedule. We yep. can call all the shots. I mean, granted, if someone gave you a budget, they're going to want it at a certain time. Yep. So then we would have to make compromises, but we don't right now. So we can, we can go as long as we want. Well, uh, we're getting some questions on uh, Facebook Live here. Uh, Kate is saying revenge, and then Rich replied, "We'll be talking about revenge." So I think that's a great segue. Let's <laughs> let's talk real quick about revenge. Revenge is a movie that I've been working on. Um, we're going to be filming again next Sunday. Kate Eppers is my lead. She's really good, very talented singer and actress. And what's what's the premise of revenge? Give us a, just a quick synopsis. It's just about a girl who's played by Kate who gets bullied by three other girls in school. They end up accidentally killing her. She comes back to life and gets ven- revenge on all her uh, classmates. I, I, I like that. So it's, it's like a zombie Mean Girls? 
yeah, kind of similar to that. She's not really a zombie, but she's more of a demon kind of okay. thing. So. I, I, I like that because that's a sign of the uh, times today because that's something that's really going on today in schools. And I think there's something chilling about when a horror <coughs> film actually hits mm. what's going on now in the world, you know. Yeah. And, and that's because I think there's a lot of a lot of the mainstream directors don't go that route. You know what I mean? Not go, that I want any of those kids to kill any of no, their bullies or but, anything, but <laughs> but but you're looking at a topic that's real, and that but that makes it more scary, more chilling to me that it's a real, a more real kind of topic. Yeah. I like that. Really and uh, now is Brian assisting you with that, or is, is uh, no? He's not working on this one. I'm just helping him out with um, his movies and stuff. So, but you, he's kind of like taking you under his wing. Yeah, yeah, does I'm he consult learning, you? I'm learning a lot from him. I've also learned a lot from Rick Chandler, a lot from Matt Fisher, Dave Maggot. You know, I'm starting to put it in on my own stuff now. I have a ton of like um, scripts that I've been writing. So, so because yeah, <clears throat> ever since I've known you, and I've known you since probably 2004, 2005, um, you've that's been always been a passion of yours. Is, is, is yeah, I just writing. regret starting it so late. But you know what? I think I think it's a big you thing. You, you have these people that you know, like Brian, that can kind of like show you like. Dude, I've been doing this for 27 years now. Let me show you a thing or two, like to help you out, because that's another cool thing. It's 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 kind of like what we talk about from the, the geek community. It's rather than let's not step on somebody else to make ourselves rise up. Let's bring that other person. Let's elevate them. Let's, yeah. Yeah, I've you know, learned a lot of uh, effects stuff from Brian. Actually, he's really good with his stuff. It becomes like a community. It's fun just to work <coughs> with other people and say, "Oh, you're doing oh, and just help out." Right. And if you Which have any advice, cool. Lots of geek communities, right? That's and that's the thing; it's all like these little it. like pockets. And I think that's just that's a really cool outlook to have. Is let's let's help each other out because then you know, it's you know you've been doing it since you know said 1990, and now you're kind of getting into it. Now at the same the same point, you guys can bounce. No, not necessarily you bounce ideas off him, but if he's like running into something, because that's my next question for you is when you first started making films, uh, what was the hardest part for you to like learn and to to get. What was the most difficult part? Was it the writing? Was it the, the effects? What what was the most challenging aspect of filmmaking the when you were starting? Part, the most difficult part was editing, definitely, because it didn't have any equipment. The very first probably four or five I did, it was two VCRs put together. Ooh. And so that was a that nightmare. That sounds brutal. <laughs> That's a horror movie in itself, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, even when we filmed, it, we didn't do like, okay, and action. We had to say to everybody, okay, count to three and then go. Once we started recording, because you, you had have to edit that, yeah. you had that second or two laps in the VCR, so mm -hmm. editing was a nightmare. <laughs> now, when you now let's go go back to those those nineteen ninety and nineteen ninety one, uh, you know, camera and two VCRs. Did you when you were making those first films? Did you film everything in sequence for editing to be easier, or did you still shoot stuff out of sequence and then put it together? No, we were still all over the place. Okay, yeah. So that made it probably even more difficult with the VCR. Yeah, method. I mean, well, actually, surprisingly, it's. It's kind of the, still the same way it is right now. You know, whatever is available, whoever is available, we film that stuff that night. And then we just log in a notebook. Okay, this tape has this on it, this on it. You go back to it. It's a, surprisingly, it's actually still the same way right now. How much easier is it now, though? Oh, editing. So much easier yeah. now. Just everything the computer. Just, yeah, you know, just, just pop it in. So much easier. And obviously, the quality is way better Do you ever say now. to yourself, God, what if I was doing like this kind of film back then? Because I'm sure your films have progressed in yeah. their complexity. At the same time as editing has moved along, so could you imagine doing a film that you're doing now, like this new one, actually editing like you did back in the day? Actually, right now, I just finished just uh, last night and the night before um, one that we did in 1994. It was actually our first full-length one. Never been released, but I've put up pictures and people want to see it. I mm -hmm. just finished re-editing it, so I went back and took out those couple of seconds between before someone speaks, so just cleaning <laughs> up the whole thing. I cu actually cut almost 10 to 15 minutes out of the movie because it was just... Another mistake you make when you first start out, you hold on things way too long. And it's like I get these endless shots of nothing. I'm like, all right, that's all coming out. Yeah. That's coming out. <laughs> so it's not like the movie's been cut or censored. It's just now it's watchable. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I think that's, that's a good point as you go along too because I'm a big proponent of with, with horror movies specifically, um, I like moments to breathe. Yeah. Um, like when, you, when you're filming something, or, or even when you're watching a horror movie and you got that, you, it's got it's a very specific type of um, time that, time lapse, if you will, where something's happened before the jump scare happens or the killer strikes or whatever. You just need that second to breathe yeah. to let it all sink in before you do the, you know. And you see that a million times. People walking through like a, a parking garage and they're looking around and then everything looks quiet and then they turn to their car then they hear a noise they peer over and it's that second to breathe and then they turn back and that's yeah. when you know or something along those lines I'm a big so 
when you're filming, I can I can understand too having all those extra like okay, we're just shooting nothing right now, and just and to edit all that out, it's going to be difficult, I would think. To how much time do you you know cut out to like for, like the pacing, the timing, yeah. and just to make those scares or the kills or whatever else it might be that more impactful, and that leads me to my next question, um, because you you talk to like different like or film people or or just like directors, you can tell when somebody has like a Scorsese style or a Spielberg style. How would you describe? Do you have a, a particular style or way you like to shoot, or is it just kind of like? Your vision, what you like, is it different? Differs from movie to movie, or do you have a specific way you like to, to shoot your your films? Uh, honestly, I have no idea what my style is. Really, I mean, I to think about it, I wouldn't be able to like really put Can't a name to it. it. But I guess if if I was gonna say, it would probably be my biggest influence, it would probably be the style of John Carpenter. I guess okay. I like the way he creates atmosphere, the way he tells his stories, and then I guess kind of the you know where we go with our movies, definitely Japanese cinema. Okay. Like the more crazier type stuff. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So what do you feel about like c- certain remakes from uh, like Japanese movies? Like The Ring was uh, a remake, right? The Ring wasn't bad. Yeah. Yeah, The Ring was bad. Um, the Grudge wasn't bad. But all the other ones were pretty terrible. Yeah. <laughs> so again, it goes back to the, the, that's kind of like my idea too when I was talking about the originals versus like remakes because it's almost like certain certain uh, or Hollywood when they're trying to come up with these big blockbuster horror movies not that most horror movies are blockbusters but they, they kind of seem like oh we can't have an original idea let's yeah. take from and that's where I think like this independent stuff or the or these like you know your self self promoted films uh, that's where I think that's because th- that's more your vision and it's not like a studio saying yeah. we needed to hit all these demographics because we want to make money off of it so let's take something that was popular somewhere else and bring it to yeah, America just put a little American flair on it the right. problem with like the main problem with the Hollywood remakes of the Japanese films is they just didn't get what made those movies so scary and creepy, and of course when it went to making the American versions, they just overdid everything, and everyone was now static going through the camera and everything. I'm like, that's not what made the other. They just didn't. It's like you tell they just don't get it, and they're just overdoing it. That leads me to a question. So when you're watching a horror film, what are the couple one two three things that um, you look for to make a great horror film. Like, what does it have to have to have your stamp of approval? A good story. Okay, a good story. Atmosphere. What about scares and things like that? Like, where does that... Uh, that I guess that depends on the movie, because, I mean, a movie can not make you jump once, but if it's just dripping with atmosphere, I love it. Just it It's just, like all build, and yeah. you're like, you have that creepy, tingling yep. feeling the whole or time you're watching. The great sets. Like, um... An example, I, I just recently, in the last few years, got into the old classic Universal har- uh, monster movies. I never watched them as a kid, but now I watch The Wolfman, and I'm in love with those sets. I see those sets all drenched in fog, and I'm just like, this is amazing looking. Yeah. And I just watch the movie. I'm just, that pulls me into the movie. Not even so much the story or whatever, it's just the look of the film. So it, do- it, so it doesn't even necessarily have to be gory to be Oh, no, good no. It's surprising because even, like I said, unfortunately, with the thing of CGI blood now, I'm not, I don't even watch movies for gore anymore because nothing lives up to what I want to see anymore. Well, and that's, that's interesting to me because I've actually had this argument, and you know, this is a little bit more dated, but when Paranormal Activity came out, yep. like I was a big fan of it because it wasn't your stereotypical, because like for me, you know, I didn't get into horror when I was younger. When I, when I was growing up, like, you know, 16 years old, it was like, I know what you did last summer, Scream. And that was like, you know, the, the, the kind of like the last boom, if you will, yeah. for me uh, in the general movie theater going. It's all like, you know, these teen hot throbs and these horror flicks. But then when Paranormal Activity came out and, you know, something like Saw, if you, I don't know if certain people don't consider that horror. I, I don't know where you, you go on that. Mm, but it's a horror movie. <laughs> um, to me, Paranormal Activity was just such a well done horror movie but not in the conventional sense where you have a slasher with an, a knife and coming yeah. because and, and I heard a lot of people complaining that like oh my god that wasn't scary the door moved and stuff but uh, but again to your point if you're in if you immerse yourself in that world and you can visualize that and you're like okay here's this couple that it's not even like a, a huge thing but there's this demonic entity like you know preying on them or watching them that's you know, the atmosphere. Like I'm yeah. going to stay in the my pants, of the whole man, thing you know is scary. I mean? like, no, I enjoyed it. I just and, and the whole uh, reality film kind of movie thing, I think that grab, grabbed people for a while. Yeah. A, well, think a well done found footage movie found can be footage. very That's scary. what I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. If it's done well, I love those because, again, like you, it just sucks you right in. 
Yeah. You're feeling the atmosphere. Yeah. It, it kind of... I, I don't know. I guess it's that voyeur type feeling. Mm -hmm. It automatically it pulls you in as long as it's, it's like you oh this energy. could be real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but to our point a little earlier, that there was a, a time when all the found footage film was way overdone as yeah. far as the horror genre. Again, they just Adding started with Blair Witch and, and then just everything, everything just yeah. jumped on from there. I think. And I, I kind of like again to the paranormal activity. I kind of like their premise where it's it's a different. It's not the same old. Oh, we found this found footage. It's like. There's a reason that you're going to see yeah. the video. There's a reason they're, they're taking that video. I'll admit, every time they cut to that camera and at night in their bedroom, I was just like, it creeped me out. Yeah. I love that. Because I, I love ghost stuff. I love paranormal stuff. So once that kicked in, I got chills. I was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> well, and, that, and that's, what, that's what I was saying. I think a lot of the, the atmosphere, to your point, like you said, the story, the atmosphere, to me, the people that were complaining about it, they wanted something to happen like every you know, yeah. 10 minutes. And I'm like, this is a roller coaster ride. You're going to be, it's like you're going up before the big drop. You have to like get those little drops in first and that climb. You have to work your way up to the climb. So when the drop happens, that's when it like hits you the hardest. Yeah. And that's so and I, I <clears throat> that's why I really appreciated a movie like that because you could tell the flow of the story. Now, don't get me wrong, like you know, like a, a Friday the thirteenth or, or you know, a Leatherface, anything like that, or, or you know, Freddy where you're gonna have like each of these group of people and then they're gonna get murdered one by one. That's awesome too. That has its own, you know, place in, in yeah. your heart as well. But just from a different storytelling standpoint, a different type of horror movie, I really appreciated the fact that it took a while to build up to the climax and yeah. I appreciated that. I if think you want to uh, see like a um, creepy horror movie, um, just watch the house that uh, the houses that October built. It's like a found fo like a found footage type film about these guys that are going looking for the perfect um, haunted house, and they come across all these carnies and stuff like that, and like you know it's got that vibe to it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. I, I coming out with a sequel too. I think so. there's something about horror mm. movies with ghosts or spirits that's has a different appeal, and I think it's just because of the fact of I think many people, not every, I can't speak for everybody, but I know people have had experiences in real life. Yeah. And I think sometimes that triggers something with a lot of people. Possibly. like Because I was, yeah, like I said, I was into it from a very young age. What's interesting is the fact that, you know, our company is kind of known for the gore and everything. We yeah. go as far as we can. And a lot of our core audience, they're not into the paranormal movies at all. Really? I'll see stuff yeah. they post on Facebook or whatever. I'm like, wow. I'm like, I'll be like, oh, I love this movie. And, like, people that watch my movies, like, they all hate it. I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, two different type of crowds sometimes. I'm I'm a big fan of uh, so when I was younger too like I said I never got into the horror genre but when I was younger and this is gonna date me a little bit but um, Nickelodeon like the Saturday Night Nickelodeon they had the TV show Are You Afraid of the Dark Oh yeah yep. <laughs> and to me like even as a kid like this is creepy stuff dude like and I was like I loved it like it scared the bejesus out of me but I loved <laughs> it and that's where I kind of got like that vibe um, but to to the point there uh, you're gonna have different audiences that you know like the different features. So again, you said yours are more gore centric typically um, with the, as Rich was covered in blood. <laughs> um, so again, yeah. So those fans of your, your work that appreciate the gore aspect, the special effects that you do aren't necessarily as going, to, going to be into more of like the paranormal yeah. to, your, to your point, which, right. you know, it's, it's good and it's bad. So, but again, certain people like CGI wolves, like we were talking about <laughs> a little while ago. What's um, interesting though, when you mix the two, We've noticed um, uh, one of my mo uh, movie called Fetus is known for its brutality and all that. But we took the time to tell a character story, and then there's some creepy, like paranormal moments, haunting type moments in it. And I saw a review from these guys who just basically just review gore films. And at one point, they're like, "This movie got under my skin." They, because we took the time to you know try to creep you out and do more than just here's a bunch of effects. Right. More than hack and slash. Yeah. So when yeah. you take the time to tell the story. It, Later, the gore has more impact because they just realize yeah. they just get invested in the story going on. And see, I, I love that because it's to me. I mean, I, I've only met you today, but you know, you seem very open to not necessarily criticism, but like what people. Because again, every it's it's a whole big genre oh, yeah. that people are going to have like different feelings for different things, and you kind of take it in stride and like, okay, your passion comes through with with a movie like Fetus, where you it did creep them out, like. It can just you can just show like we put a lot of effort into this. We want that was the point we wanted to be, yeah. um, and that leads to uh, my next couple of questions here. Um, if people want to check out some of your works, um, where can they where can they see some of your stuff? Uh, well, let's say uh, Bone Sickness was the one that got the most exposure. Um, we do sell have we now have copies again at morbidvisionfilms.com. but even 
there's a good chance you could find a used copy somewhere in a store that sells used DVDs. That because that one went to all the retail stores, which blew my mind. So that one's very easy to find. You, all you do is type it in eBay, and it'll come up. What wherever. do you think it was about bone sickness that captured people? If you had to guess, because you're saying it, you keep saying it like it blows your mind. You don't understand <laughs> how. It what would your guess be as to why it's so loved? Uh, the zombies. It was um. It was before. It was before the new boom. It was before Walking Dead, and Resident all that. Evils, and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. And at the actually at the time before we managed to release that, zombies did kick off again with Resident Evil and all that stuff. Yeah. But it was all either fast zombies or fresh zombies. Twenty eight days, that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And we purposely did it as an Italian Lucio Fulci style, dusty, slow rotting zombies. So every one of them was like <laughs> full, full makeup, full everything. So horror. F- the horror fans seem to have really latched onto that. They enjoyed seeing. There was a part in the movie for ten minutes or nine minutes. We just basically stopped the movie and we built a whole set. We slowly had the rotted zombies crawling out of their graves, and we just f- that was a key point in the movie. And um, between that and then the over the top gore, it was just I think people were just like, oh yes, finally here's a zombie. Because yeah, a lot of the zombie see. films, believe it or not, aren't as gory today yeah. as you would think you'd want as people would want them to be yeah they don't actually they, go, they don't for, well, go like for what it. romero and savini were doing they would just say oh let's do this gag let's do this gag yeah like they throw a lot on a lot of blood but there's where's not... the original creativity and yeah it's like i don't know maybe l- some people seem to think if you splash as much blood around then that's well that's not really <laughs> gore gore is when yeah. you see the body open up you see you the see organs and the stuff spilling out yeah blood, yeah that's an, I, I've never thought about it that way. It's just not like, hey, it's just a bunch of bloodshed. Cause that, yeah, there's that the blo- right. there can be a bloody movie, but then a gory movie is the more graphic anatomical yeah. gore. That's like yeah. that's why you know in Romero's and Savini's stuff back in the '80s. That was the stuff that so was very visceral. What do you think about some of the um, other cult movies? Not well, yeah, cult movies. So things like um, I Spit on Your Grave, Human Centipede, those kind of things. I loved Human Centipede, the first one, for what it was, because it yeah. was just so. Out there. I think the creepiest thing to me when I was watching that movie was when they're all strapped in to the the three of them are strapped into the beds and he's yeah. explaining to them yeah. what he's going to do <laughs> and like that was like okay I'm turning this off right now yeah. and I'll come back later <laughs> because it was just like whoa this is where we're going with this like because yeah, he's explaining those, the whole so job and everything I'm like it's one of those movies where you expl- you tell someone about it, they're like they didn't really he's make like a so movie. you will like, eat no, here they really did make a movie you, about you will that eat and here <laughs> and it will travel through yeah. I'm like no. No, no. When it comes to <laughs> outrageous <laughs> concepts, when someone actually just goes far and does it, I love yeah. it when people do that. Yeah, that. Although I hated the sequel, I, I did too. Because the sequel is kind of like based on f- a guy watching the first yeah, one. That I'm like, is, you just came up with this great concept. You just you like, I don't care. We're doing this. This is the movie. And then, and then for the it. second one, oh, that was just the movie. I was like, screw you. you and, just... and so what I heard, what I heard on that one too, is that the person who made that movie, I can't remember the guy's name, Tom Six. So, so he basically lied to his investors, right, about what the movie was. Oh, maybe. Yeah, I didn't even think. Well, that's what I read. <laughs> yeah. I read that he couldn't get investors, so he lied about what the movie was, uh. and then left. Then in the final cut, was like, "This is what it is," and they were like, "Uh," because <laughs> nobody wanted to, yeah, wanted to pay for that. I just didn't so. like the fact that the sequel was like it was the oh, it's only a dream. Yeah, it's like you're not committing to commit, and, commit to the, and know. it was ve- I, you know a lot of vile scenes. Very that one was very yeah. graphic. But if anyone complains about it, you can just sit back and go, "Oh, that was just all in his head." Yeah, uh, that's a cop out. To yeah, me. <laughs> uh, that that was a little disturbing. Three was fun though. <laughs> well, Don Don on Rubble. Facebook Live is saying uh, the second and third one were both awful. As far I as never as even saw one of them. I the third one was so stupid that it was. <laughs> I saw the first one. The two. Uh, I saw the first one. I loved it. Second one, I gave it a chance, and I was just no, couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's get into some guest questions here, uh, or some fan questions rather. Um, my friend who's been on the show a couple episodes ago, Aaron, wants to say, uh, do you do you ever have instances where your you your creativity when making films is at a standstill, and if so, how do you kind of overcome that? Do you ever have like something when you're making a film and you're like Oh, I, 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 I'm, I kind of hit an impasse here. I, I'm writer's block or anything along those lines. And actually, it's ha- it happened in the movie we're making right now. The new one's called Septic, and normally all of our movies are fantasy, supernatural, paranormal based or creatures. Always, because I, I got in through doing makeup effects, yeah. so I was always into that side of it. This one is just human based. It's basically you know based on like the deep web type stuff with red rooms and snuff films and all that. Hmm. 
And it gets to a point where I'm like, I got to a point where I was like, I was having trouble trying to think of a new interesting way to kill someone just on videotape. Because <laughs> it got to a point where I'm like, all right, this, all right, we have to keep everything reality based. What can I do we've next? We've done this. We've done this. Yeah. We've done this. With, with, with and next the, all the problem is everyone else in the underground, everyone else is doing the snuff thing too. Yeah. So it just kind of, th- this wasn't meant to be a movie. Okay. It was supposed to be just a special feature on one of our older movies that had to do with snuff films that we we're going to re- give to a distributor. And uh, as the story unfolded, next thing you know, like, oh, let's make this our next feature film. wasn't intended. It just happened. It evolved But naturally. sometimes that's how the best things happen. Exactly. By yeah. accident. You know. That's how most of our movies happen. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, because the fact that I'm like, all right, this is the first time since 1993 or four that I did a, just a reality human-based movie. So it, it, that kind of made some of the kills a little more difficult because normally we can be really creative. We have tentacles coming out of people all over the place, you know, people being <laughs> mutated. But no, I'm like, nope, everything's going to be, yeah, the power tools are a knife. And yeah. you got, power tools are limited, too, because if you use a chainsaw, you're just ripping off your Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So yeah. you got to come up with something more interesting. And if you go into what Saw did, I mean, they did all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah. So it's like staying ahead with something creative and trying not to take copy or copy yeah, from yeah. someplace else because it, they're so vast mm-hmm. on what people are doing. Normally, so it must be challenging sometimes. No, when I get to that point, I usually I just step back. Mm-hmm. And it will eventually just come to me naturally. Let the brain reset a little bit. Yeah. I like cuz I guess it gets to a point where you're trying too hard. Yep. And then you realize yeah. I'm like, oh, this no, this ain't working. And then it's like, no, just step back. I'll go watch some movies or whatever and in a yeah. week or two, next thing you know, hey, bang, there we go. We get mm-hmm. right back into it again. Poor Don wants to talk about um, Wreck. He's going about going on about that movie. <coughs> that was a great found footage movie. Yeah, it was. I I, I've never seen it, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of... Yeah, uh, I haven't seen it either, so... I haven't really seen the original that much, but uh, Quarantine was like the um, the remake. Well, Quarantine was, was all right. Yeah. It was okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What I loved about record is I always call it record. I can't. I don't know which way is the supposed to be the right way to say it, but um, what I love is the fact that it wasn't until halfway through the sequel that you find out what it's actually the first movie was actually about, and huh. they completely screw with you, and it's like, nope, this isn't what you thought you were watching. <laughs> but it's not until halfway d- into the part two, I'm like, that is awesome. I thought that was so great what they did. I won't ruin it, I guess. If you know yeah, yeah. Well, I think Don it. Don was saying that was an old question at that point. It was old hat. But um, a couple other questions, and actually, I've, I'm reading through some of these. Some of these are actually really good. So thank you, thank you, Aaron, if you're still watching. Uh, we talked a little earlier about like how when you put your movies out, you it's you know it's your budget. It's you, you know you don't you're not. Uh, it's it's all self self produced self made. Um, have you ever when you, when you're doing like your filmmaking, and there's going to be certain points where you have to figure out budget stuff because obviously you know it's it's your own money. Uh, how much do you compromise? Sometimes how how often have you had to compromise either creativity or uh, set pieces, filming equipment, makeup, costumes, and have like how do you work around some of those uh, issues when it comes to budgetary reasons? I would say probably the what we have to. Um compromise most on it i guess i guess i don't want to say this the wrong way because i don't want to put you know make it look like i'm talking down anyone that takes part in our movies but it would be acting we can't we don't have the money to hire professional actors um stuff like that so a lot of times i mean rich was just saying we gave him a line to do the other like, a couple of weeks ago and he's like i'm not an actor i'm like neither and are we cut me. <laughs> none of us are actors well that's because it we took you like 37 me. times to get the line <laughs> out, dude. didn't go well so right, i got so cut that's the main one is yeah our which and we we <laughs> we do catch crap for it in reviews sometimes. So people that aren't used to like the underground stuff, um, they'll say, you know, they'll go on about the effects, but then they'll talk about the acting. Like oh, but it's like yeah. But yeah, again, but, but acting is kind of like the last thing you're going to be able to get, like you said, because you have the budget constraints. Yeah. So do you bu- you budget out the whole movie beforehand, or you kind of oh, go no, along? No, no, just, just whatever's of... left after that week's paycheck. <laughs> that's what goes into <laughs> the movie. That, that, that's, that's solid also, commitment. And that's again, the other reason yeah. why it takes like two years for us to film. But again, it's that's you save up for, and you have your vision. And as long as the vision's not compromised, and it's your vision, then that's awesome. Yeah. Um, because that's her, one of her other follow up questions. But before I get into that follow up question, uh, something another question she asked: If you ever had a chance to work with any big names, actors, actresses, directors. Whatever, if, if money were no object in a, you know, Powerball, you hit Powerball and you have, who would, who would be one of the actors you'd want to, or actresses you'd want to oh work God, with? God, his name just flew right out of my head. I don't believe it. <laughs> Sean Pertwee is my favorite actor. 
from once I saw Dog Soldiers, yep. I thought he was just absolutely amazing. And I, well, actually, no, because I saw Event Horizon first, and he really caught my attention. Like, that guy's really good. I love, he's just so natural. Yeah. Sean, Sean Pertwee. I, he wow. plays uh, I, Alfred. Yeah, but I'm just thinking, wow, he was in, he was in Event Horizon. Yeah, he's, I, um, he was like, oh the, my uh, God, the, yes, I know like who he is now. Guy. Yes. He's the one that finds the bomb, and he's like, oh, wow. But then when he put Jesus. his Sarge and Dog Because it was so soldiers. long ago, was, we see him on Gotham all the time. Well, yeah, I, and I just saw him, I was at uh, Heroes and Villains Fan Fest in New Jersey, and he was one of the actors <laughs> signing there, and I didn't get a chance to, to talk to him. But I was, was so disappointed last year. Didn't have the money to go to Rhode Island Comic Con. Yeah, yeah. I found out that Friday. I don't know why. Something so stupid I did. I'm like, I'm just going to go on the site, see who was there. I saw he was there. I'm like, he's 15 minutes from my house, and mm-hmm. I don't have the money to go. <laughs> I'm like, oh, why <laughs> did I look? <laughs> yeah, well, you can, then you're kicking yourself. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, this is a great segue. I love having you on. <laughs> uh, next week, if my guest comes through, we'll be having Jackie Robbins uh, talking about Rhode Island Comic Con. She handles a lot of the celebrity uh, travel stuff Ooh. for for that as well. So she'll be hopefully here to discuss that. And if not, we'll find a, a replacement time. But I'm trying to confirm with her now. Uh, going back to filmmaking, though, and we talked about the budget. We talked about um, actors and actresses and certain things. Like when you're making this film, and, and we kind of touched upon it a little earlier, um, when you start the, the process, does your vision change as you're making the movie, as you're going through that process, and you're like, oh, I could think of what I thought was going to work before wouldn't work for this, or I found a better way to do this? And, and how do you handle situations like that? That happens constantly on our movies, and I think it's something that helps us. It definitely makes us for making better movies than... Cause a lot of times, I started writing out full scripts, and mm. it got to a point, I think it was halfway through Bone Sickness, I was writing the script out, and I'm like, let's just stop filming. I'm sick of writing. <laughs> and I realized, I'm like, we're not submitting a script to uh, someone to finance the movie. We don't have to have a full script. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't yeah. have to be. Yeah. And a lot of times, we, we noticed on the one before that where we had a full script, so many times it looks great, sounds great on paper. You go to do it live, and you're doesn't like, work. Oh, this doesn't work yeah. at all. And then you have to figure out how to fix it. Uh, uh, we come up with an outline, and then we just stop filming. I know what we're, we're making. A lot of times, sometimes the end of the movie isn't there at all. But mm-hmm. we know what the premise of the movie, we know what it is, and we just start shooting. And I always say, now we just let our movies evolve naturally as we film. And sometimes I'm sure that helps with the ideas, too, oh, right? Because yeah. as you're filming, you're thinking, and you're like, oh, we can go this way, we can go this way, we can go this way, rather Absolutely. than trying to bang it all out at once. Yeah, because we've pu- if I think half the time, if we put out and created the <laughs> first idea we had, it would have been a terrible movie compared to what we came out with. <laughs> because over time, as you're on the set and you, you have a character do something, you could change something. Also, I'm like, wait a minute, that opens up this for this and this. And then go back, brainstorm, write up. Next thing you know, you, I come back, like, oh, by the way, this is how the movie is. What? Where did all that come from? Well, it's one c- thing that I love about working with him is the fact he changes things all the time. It just, yeah, we just, it's whatever. Different, if something know, doesn't work. a script in front of you, you know? Yeah, it just, <clears throat> I don't know. It just allows a lot more creativity. Well, but we can only do that because we don't have a budget and we're working with all of our own funds, so. And that was another question that Erin had, and she said, this one's a little kind of a girly question, but <laughs> I, I disagree. Um, do you ever get emotionally connected to either uh, the characters or the uh, antagonists? And, and then, uh, like, essentially, do you ever get emotionally committed to one of the characters in the film as you're making where it's kind of more difficult for you to do a death scene or something because of the connection to a character? Or is it do you design the scripts with kind of like almost like a step back, like this is just a, a fictional character and I have no problem killing them off? Or do you put like your own personality into any of your characters too? All right, this kind of goes on to a, maybe a little bit of a difference, uh, kind of an offshoot of the subject. Sure. But this actually just came up while we are filming Saturday night. And um, character-wise, not so much. But someone asked me, uh, me and my wife, we have a lot of animals. We've done a lot of fostering. <laughs> someone asked me, how come none of your animals are in your movies? It's a good question. <laughs> if you have a lot of animals, right? That's yeah. Great like question. <laughs> the actual answer, and this is going to sound probably some, I'd surprise people when I say this, because our movies, we've been banned in Germany for being too brutal. Our movies are known for extreme gore, extreme brutality. I don't put an- my animals in the movies because I don't want the, lot, almost everyone dies in our movies half the time. I don't want those animals to be orphaned by the characters dying. That's, that's the yeah, that's the reality of it. Because sometimes we'll watch. I'll get you get like, oh, that's a great. Um, you know, you watch a movie and like they've got the cute pet, they you know, the dog or the cat. 
person dies, like, what happens to the dog now? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to feel that in my movie. <laughs> so oh, that's that, my, that's that, my that, honest. That cute answer. little kitten is just sitting there. Well, sitting there. Exactly <laughs> why none of my characters have animals. Who's feeding the fish? <laughs> that's yeah. No, because that's that's it's very it's that's very interesting because uh, you know you don't think about that that way. Yeah. And like, not that it's again, it's still a fictional world. So it's it's. I think it's a good like. It's an interesting dynamic to be like. I don't. Ha- I have no problem with these fictional characters yeah. getting killed. But if it's an animal, and I see an animal getting killed, especially if it's an animal that I've, like you said, you fostered or, yeah. or whatever, even though it's in a fictional world, it's still like that's a little bit more uh, gut wrenching than yeah. than opposed to a character that an actor or an actress is yep. is playing. And that's, I'll do that's the worst things imaginable to humans, but when I wonder what the animals, animal like thinks <laughs> looking at it. Like, <laughs> what? It's I just, like yeah. in Aliens <laughs> when the cat's left there after like the dude gets ripped apart. I know the cat's just. What's going on? I have no <laughs> place to go now. We actually we ended up fostering a cat that looks exactly like Jonesy from Aliens. Oh, funny. You don't want to do a what, was it Stephen King uh, Cat's Eye? Is that the movie that he did? It was like it was like yeah, a cat that one that went at Pet Cemetery. Poor little uh, church. <laughs> well, on Facebook Live right now, uh, Deb Marini is saying she cries for animals more than she does people, and she also mentioned it's my she, wife. Yeah. Yes, uh, we know this. <laughs> Uh, she she was an actress actually in a, in a mm-hmm. short I saw uh, called was it Man- was a mannequin mannequin yeah. she's actually taking over uh, directing for Revenge next go. Sunday wow. so I can work Rock and Shock so what so okay so am I when I see this am I gonna be like oh that, that's a that's a Deb scene that's 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 Deb's vision right there <laughs> no. I got it all written out for her to go, but she'll be Hopefully directing you won't it. be watching it. Wow, the movie got really good all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Uh, th- this, this five minutes of the movie is awesome. <laughs> Actually, I've, I've known I've known Deb longer than I've known Rich, so I, I would give Deb all the credit in the world if it's you know once I watch it, I'm like, oh, this is really good. It's all Deb. So I, got, <laughs> I got you, kid. Um, yeah, and Kate Kate agrees. She says she feels the exact same way. She can't watch a movie if an animal dies. And I understand about not wanting to have an animal there because it's sad to think what will happen uh, when its owner is dead. So it's it's kind of it's, uh, it's a it's a perspective I never took before about with like like yeah who's going to take care of this animal now? It's going to be living on the street or it could be starving or anything along those lines. And that's yeah, yeah that's I and never thought of it from that. On the other side of it too, when they are in the movies, one thing that's kind of been turning me off lately is because you see it done so many times. You watch a movie and they own a dog, and my wife will go right oh you know the dog's going to die. And it gets to the point where it's like, it's like you want to look at the writing. Like, seriously, you're just gonna go for the, you know, get the hot strings by killing the family pet again. Like in every other movie, everyone always goes for the family pet. It's like think of something different. Mm-hmm. Think of something like they can't come up with anything that's like gonna uh, hit the audience enough. So like, oh, let's just kill the pet. <laughs> because I think, yeah, again, the majority of the the audience is that's gonna be. You they know, know that's gonna work. Yeah. Because I think I think even in. A conventional sense, like animals, for the most part, especially specifically domesticated animals, pets, are all innocent. Like, mm. you know what I mean? It's it's the old adage where, like, you know, you can hit a dog and the dog's gonna think it's his fault or her fault because it's it doesn't, you know, it, it loves its owner unconditionally. Yeah. And it's like to see an animal like that, like people, for the most part, you can look at a person and be like, oh my god, the, you know, I, we don't get political here. So, Don even mentioned in the comments, KB, stop getting political when you're talking about bullying and all that fun <laughs> stuff. But we 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 don't go into that. But, political. but I, I think the idea <laughs> is. As an audience, I think we can look at people and be like, oh, my God, you know, and I, I kind of even turned to Rich when we saw it. And uh, again, semi-spoilers here, but nothing nothing big. If you've seen the movie or you read the book, the, the t- made-for-TV movie or read the book, mm. there's bullies. Yeah. And I turned to Rich during when these bullies were being bullies. I turned to Rich and said, if the clown kills them, I'd be okay with it. And I think about <laughs> it, like, with people being flawed, I think as an audience member, when you see violence happening to another human – you can kind of rationalize it a little bit better when you see like an, it happen to an animal being like, this is just this animal that loves you unconditionally. Can't rationalize it, it. It has yeah. no ill will at all. And to see, you know, I think that's why, why it hits people harder. Rich yeah. is shaking his head. Even Kuja. Yeah, I don't like it. Um, <laughs> I don't like it either, you know? And I hate like, you know, when like in reality, like, you know, how a dog will go and bite somebody and automatically they're put down. But yet we can just throw somebody in jail and let them sit in there. Like, you know, the same thing should so happen to them. Would you, you want know? to see a dog go to a pound? <clears throat> no. Sit in a pound? I'm just saying he shouldn't be put down because he bit somebody because he doesn't know better. Well, you know, a okay, dog doesn't really I don't know better. Get, I don't want to get into all political stuff. <laughs> I, I agree with what you're saying, and that's that's a whole <laughs> other... That's another conversation for me. <laughs> I know. That, that's all philosophy and morals and ethics yeah. and 
We don't yeah. do that here. My uh, movies have no morals. Yeah, let, let, let's stop. There you go. <laughs> let, let's Animals stop being more important. L- l- let's let's stop focusing let's, on. Uh, let's get into our final segment, shall we? Because we're <laughs> we've been going strong for a while here. Uh, we've been going on for almost an hour, so let's get into. Really well. Uh, we're going to play our old theme for, I think, adding character. I'm not going to play the final countdown okay. unless you guys want to hear the, the final countdown theme. We have two different themes. We're I haven't get heard the our... adding character theme All in a right. while. Well, let's, let's, let's do that. We're going to do a new segment called the Mount Rushmore, which everybody does, but we're going we're gonna to do it this time, too. So this is our temporary theme song for this segment. Nobody messes with Adam Wee. Adam West. Love Adam West from Family Guy. Uh, rest in peace, Adam West. Um, okay, so the, the, we usually typically at this point do a countdown where we rank our top three or our top five. KB actually came up with a very cool concept because they do it you know, in different like uh, uh, sports shows, ESPN and whatnot. They do the Mount Rushmore. If you were to do a Mount Rushmore, the top four of something, so instead of ranking them, who would be your top four horror whether they be villains or let's just say characters. That would be on the mountain. Be on the mountain, the the, the iconic ones. So I'll go first because I don't have a dog in this fight and I'm not as passionate. I'm going to say Jason, Freddy Krueger, Chucky from Child's Play, and uh, Ghostface Killer or whatever from Ghost Scream. Ghostface Killer, Ghost- the rapper. Well, what what do they what do they call the, what do they call the killer? His name Ghost. It is Ghostface. Ghostface yeah. yeah. Ghostface. So there you go, KB. Shut up. Uh, Ghostface. Because <laughs> yeah, whatever. He he's awesome too. He'd be on there too, just for that. <laughs> KB, who would you put on um, your? Uh, I'm I'm kind of close on your list. Um, Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees. I think it's kind of hard to ignore those guys if you're talking like the best, you know, yeah. most popular of all time. Um, I think then Leatherface, I think has to be on there for me. Um, and then Michael Myers. I think th- those are the four. I think that'd be more my mainstream one. So I had a more underground list, but we're talking about Rushmore. Best, why can't you we know. just like do both? Well, we we can if you want. Let's just I'll just do this. But you and I both did killers because we were talking about this, and it'd be cool if you put like you know, <laughs> I don't know, JB Lee Curtis, Jaws, you know, yeah, or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. That, like, Jaws can be on the list. Why yeah, not? It's, it's an iconic character. Cujo, from horror movie, Bruce, so <laughs> you know, yeah, Bruce. So w- w- how about Rich? How about you? Alien. What be your uh, <laughs> you know. Well, for main guys, I'd have to put Jason, Freddy, and Leatherface. And then who would be the fourth? The fourth one's a tough one. That's why I picked Mike Myers. I thought that was kind of fills out the Pinhead? List. No. I don't know. It's hard with me. Because <laughs> I, <can laughs> I can do uh, you know, my underground guys. But like for top guys, it's like those three and maybe... Jaws. <laughs> the tall man, I guess, from a phantasm. It's a good one. Brian, how about you? It would definitely Jason. But then I'd go in a different direction. It would be the Tar Zombie from Return of the Living Dead. Uh, That's a good one. The nickname Raul, the skeleton in the window and creep show at the beginning. Okay. And probably the one of the head werewolves in um, The Howling, the one that picks up the girl in the office. Um, oh, I think it's Eddie Quist, actually. Okay. His werewolf. okay. Very cool. Uh, did you want to do an underground list, Rich, since you were talking <laughs> or about diff- it? Or just a, a different <laughs> list if you had a second Yeah, a different list. I'll uh, throw uh, Chrome Skull on there from Lead to Rest. Um, and The Collector from The Collector, that movie. Um, <laughs> All right, we'll just do it. We'll just go with those two because so I wasn't so prepared. The, the car, they're carving the other two faces in Mount Rushmore. Katie, yeah, I think yeah. I'm gonna I think we're gonna need to Old work on this two. segment. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the main segment was fine. Yeah. But, but why? But like my list when I when I did my list, I kind of had a thought like with all those main characters. I think the reason why I picked those four is while they're all kind of the same in the kind of violence that they have, they all kind of have a different what's the word I'm looking for uh, mentality in how you know like Freddy's pure revenge, right? Because Parents murder him, mm. right, for killing their kids, and he's—it's a revenge. Spoiler alert: Jason's <laughs> kind of a revenge. Guy but too. it's also, but Jason's a bit more sympathetic in the fact that, right, he drowns yeah. by ignorance of camp counselors, right, and then the mother's kind of crazy in the first one, right. So it's more of a sympathetic character, I think, than Freddy is. Yeah. Um, and then Leatherface is kind of just what it, it was talking about somebody that's raised with the Sawyers and the Hewitts, who are with these just crazy people, and he's. 
slow one. Uh, just deranged. And yeah. just deranged. Yeah. So it's another perspective. And then you have Michael Myers that it's like a dark void. You know what I mean? Like the characters just avoid yeah. to me. So like I feel like, yeah, while well, they're all slashers, they're all slightly different in yeah. the mentality behind how they were written. The whole thing with Michael Myers, that was only just supposed to be like an image of the boogeyman. Yeah. He wasn't even, in a way, he wasn't even meant to be real in a way, yeah. kind of. So I felt like that, that that was like my criteria for like, okay, these are these four icons are very different, and that's why I put them up there. Your yeah. wife jumped in on there, Rich, and she said uh, she put the writer for Saw, scary stuff he came up with. Jigsaw. Yeah. I don't I don't know if she means Jigsaw. She might actually just mean the writer. I don't know mm. what she... I don't know what you mean. Debbie, clarify on that for me, please. Um, James Wan. Is that he's one of the writers. Is that what she's... I don't he's know one of the guys who did Insidious. Oh, okay. In that Con- was a good movie. Conjuring. I like that movie. Um, okay, so this this pretty much wraps up the show. Um, before we go out, I want to thank our sponsors again, Pachico's Furniture, uh, Ritual Sweat Society, uh, Local Blast for all your marketing needs. Um, oh, and Deb says the actual writer. Uh, Actually... You want to like push uh, Rock and Shock? He'll be there. Okay, well that's that's so, where I'm going yeah. to next. Okay. I want to thank our All sponsors right. first, but now <coughs> I want to thank our guests, uh, gentlemen. Uh, do you have anything to plug? Of course, we want to plug uh, Brian's website. Go to morbidvisionfilms.com. Check out all of his stuff. He's got some trailers there. Again, very uh, graphic, so not safe for work, but check it out. It's very well done. Um, there was a Japanese trailer and a German trailer, I believe. That in the German one, we actually dubbed in German. Which yeah, was, I'm which surprised is, they which did is that. cool. <laughs> um, so that one's definitely not work safe. Right, I so put that one up. Uh, but anything else you want to plug? Uh, pl- events you're going to, events you're taking part in? Well, yeah, October 13th, 14th, and 15th is Rock and Shock in Worcester at the DCU Center. We'll have our, uh, we'll have a the Black Morbid tent will be set up there. We've been there every single year. There's a good chance we're the only vendor that's been there every year. I think that's in the 13th or 14th year. So we'll be there all weekend. Okay. okay. Uh, anything else you guys want to plug? Your films? Do you, again, want to plug your films that are coming out, the, your projects that you're working on, so people can keep an eye out? I mean, obviously let me know, and we'll, we'll push those out too, but just give uh, a quick uh, shout-out to the, the projects you're working on now one more time. <clears throat> working on Revenge, the movie. That should be wrapping up next Sunday, and then it'll be off to editing it. Um, and they have a, our own website, a Facebook page for that too. Okay, and then just give that to me when once the the movie is coming to close mm-hmm. to a uh, release, and uh, we'll you know we'll promote that. And, and then Brian, anything else? Uh? Uh, we're still trying to get our movie Morbid Tales anthology released. Um, one of the nightmares of being self funded. We are running into problem after problem. We were hoping to have it out last October. We're st- looks like it's going to get pushed back again, unfortunately. So we're still trying to get that DVD out, and then we're almost finished filming Septic, and that will be out probably summer two thousand eighteen. And then all the information will be at your website again, yep. Morbid Vision Film. So check that out. Um, it's on the video here. Uh, for those listening um, to the podcast version, check the show notes. I'll put the link in there. Uh, that's all. So, gentlemen, thank you for uh, coming awesome. in tonight. And uh, Thanks for having us. Uh, yes, awesome. Uh, awesome. And then, awesome Rich, uh, once your, your, your film's coming on, too, I know you had a couple of uh, you know, both Deb and uh, what's her name? Katie? Kate. Kate Appers. Kate. Kate, if Kate wants to come on, she's more than welcome. Maybe to. we can bring them on around the time he releases his film. That's what I'm saying. We'll, yeah. we'll promote, and then promote. you know, same thing, Brian. Anytime you want to come yeah. back on, man, want to promote stuff. Yeah. Give yeah. us a this show. Is great, thanks for having me. Uh, uh, we loved having you, uh, KB. We're gonna go back to the old catchphrase since you say Friday. I, for, I forget it, so you're gonna have to. No, do it, brother. you said the, the old catchphrase. Oh, because you said oh, because here's the thing. We used to have this saying: start your weekend with your geek friends and get your geek on. All right, that's it. <laughs> Bye, folks. <laughs>